I think we can start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alessandra Paricio. I'm a reader at the University of Manchester and um, uh, I will be chairing this uh, event. Uh, thank you very much everyone for your time and for uh, joining us um, and a special thank to our uh, speaker today, Professor Kang, Ling, uh, Kang Lee, um, who I'm uh, going to, to introduce. Um, so Professor Kang Lee holds the chair of Smart Energy Systems and leads the Institute of Communication and Power Networks at School of Electricity electronic and, um, and electrical engineering at Un University of Leeds. His primary research interest lies on the development of advanced modeling, control and optimization methods in energy, transport and manufacturing application applications. His work on the development of minimal invasive cloud-based energy and condition monitoring platforms called Point Energy Technology has been successfully trialed in food processing and polymer processing industries, winning several awards and being included in the finalists of the Sustainable Energy Awards to, uh, 2016 from Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. He is currently leading the development of energy hubs for LEED demonstration targeted as many of the uh, 2,500 railway stations to support railway decarbonization in collaboration with key stakeholders and industrial partners. Professor Lee has published over 200 international journal papers and edited 19 international conference proceedings in this area, winning over 15 national and international prizes and awards, including 2019 Springer uh, Nature China New Development Award in recognition of the exceptional contributions to the delivery of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Lee with us today. And uh, uh, he will uh, talk today about nexus of railway and power networks in net zero transition, challenges and some solution. Uh, after the presentation, we will then open the question and uh, um, answer uh, session and you can also uh, write your questions uh, right in, in, in the chat. Okay, Professor Ling, the floor uh, is yours. You, you can uh, share your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Alessandra, and uh, thank you for your uh, introduction. It's very nice to meet you again. Can you see the screen now? Can you yes, see the great. screen? Great, yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. okay. Right. thanks very much. Great, uh, great. and uh, good afternoon. And, and thanks again, and Alexandra and Lauren for your organization and uh, Alexandra for your invite. Uh, well, this is probably uh, is the second uh, talk that I've given uh, in Manchester. <laughs> Last year, I was invited to give a, a, a talk uh, on a battery storage system, which I've been working uh, for uh, uh, in the last decade. Um, so this this time, uh, uh, Alexandra kindly invited me uh, to uh, give a, a talk. I was wondering uh, <laughs> what I'm gonna uh, talk, and uh, would be the wondering, you know, because obviously I don't want to uh, really, uh, uh, you know, let you sleep if I talk to uh, about the same topic. So I decided to change uh, change a little bit uh, about the uh, the uh, the railways, uh, which is I've been working. Uh, on this area um, probably uh, uh, a few years, well, five, four, five years ago, um, uh, since, I, since I moved uh, uh, to, to Leeds. Um, and myself, actually, I quite, uh, well, basically transport um, decarbonization uh, is my research, um, you know, um, uh, for a number of years, but the railway is uh, relatively uh, new. And so I, I, as a lot of slides last night I collected, um, so uh, if if uh, if there's a, don't be surprised if you saw some typos or some errors, or or you, I cannot uh, I explain well myself because a lot of work has been done and joined by uh, with my students. So <laughs> uh, you know, like uh, like uh, what uh, like a lot of. Uh, what not love. I, I'm, 
uh, uh, you know, people of my age probably not like uh, back to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I do all these uh, derivations myself. <laughs> so I uh, hope I, um, but I hope that uh, this topic is interesting uh, to you, uh, to the audience. Uh, likewise, uh, it's, all, it's, it's really a, a research topic that I'm, uh, I'm quite uh, interested in, and, and I put a lot of my effort uh, on it uh, in the last few years. Uh, the talk of today, uh, oh, sorry about this walk, because obviously I, I've not been to Manchester for, for you know, uh, no, not friends there, so uh, glad to see some of, of uh, familiar faces or in the audience. So the topic of today is about the railway and the power networks, uh, the nexus, so it means, you know, the coupling really of the railways and the power networks uh, and the, their decarbonization. Um, the challenges and and and, 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 and solutions. So what I mean, solution here is really it is a, it is a um, uh, the the recent work uh, which is any energy hard uh, which I've been working on uh, in the last uh, few years. So. Um, So today's talk, pretty much, uh, I, I, I have five sections, well, six sections, apart from the first two sections and last sections a bit light. Uh, I will focus on, on the uh, energy hub uh, and some of the technologies, um, which is I, my recent work. Now, the, the, obviously, Manchester, so, you know, has been, uh, has you know, it's well established on the power system analysis and, and the controls, uh, you know, world leading on um, this area. And, uh, and the railways obviously uh, is uh, something, uh, you know, um, again, it's, it's not, it's, you know, railway research is, is something, you know, this country, UK has, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of years of, of histories. Uh, now the railway uh, at moment, the peak, uh, you know, in the UK, we have around 15,000 kilometer uh, routes uh, in this country. But the, during the Victoria time, the peak, uh, uh, the peak time, uh, you know, the, the routes is about 30, over 30 uh, kilometers, uh, the whole country. So it's been half of this, but it's still, uh, that's the challenging, really. Now, uh, as we move to the um, uh, transport decarbonisation, uh, railways still uh, quite uh, efficient, uh, as also uh, it is um, could, could you reduce a lot of uh, emissions as well as more efficient as well providing service, and therefore uh, the railway and railway uh, railway uh, decarbonisation uh, becomes a focus, but. Uh, so I talk about uh, I'll begin with the the really the uh, the coupling of the railway and the power networks uh, uh, and then highlight some of the challenges uh, and then the solutions and technologies uh, I will present and finally a few uh, reflections. So the 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 railway system uh, and the power networks uh, pretty much they are coupled. Uh, one of the examples I like to uh, introduce is uh, those colleagues working on the power systems. You probably recall back to uh, three years ago, uh, more than three years ago, um, the uh, the outage that occurred uh, on one of these uh, after Friday afternoons, um, uh, which um, they. Um, pretty much uh, 9th of August, uh, 2019. Um, um, so that's pretty much, you can see uh, the timelines, um, it's, it's pretty close to the, you know, the peak time. Um, and normal, uh, you know, it's 4.52 uh, p.m. is normal windy, you know, warm days. Uh, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then some light, Lightning strikes, uh, you know, on transmission circuits, but are restored. But then, all of a sudden, the two uh, units uh, were cut off. Uh, so that uh, uh, amounts to over 1.3 uh, gigawatt loss. So, uh, so 
that has to trigger the this protection system and hence uh, the demand uh, five percent of the uh, electricity demand uh, uh, has been cut off um, but uh, luckily within uh, a, a, a an hour uh, the DNO uh, uh, managed to reconnect uh, the customers uh, it, but obviously the impact is significant and uh, not only uh, millions uh, of customers they were have no power uh, for uh, for less than uh, uh, one hour. Uh, airport the critical infrastructure were affected. Now the system managed to restore, uh, which is obviously the energy storage, you know, the grid support facilities uh, does uh, contribute. Uh, but look at the transport. Actually, the transport uh, this uh, this cart has caused a, a, a quite uh, significant uh, uh, transport cow, uh, cows uh, across uh, England uh, and the Wales uh, after major uh, power cuts, particularly those um, you know south east you know area not London the south east areas. Lots of people commute back you know uh, to five o'clock around five o'clock. Lots of people have to commute back to their uh, you know, home, uh, and then or if I face this, no, um, no transport, um, and that takes many, many hours for underground railways to restore. Uh, so, so this is a, this is an example show the coupling uh, of the um, of the of the power networks and and the failures uh, from the power networks uh, is cascaded down to the transport system. Um, but this is just only one, you know, major event. Um, I will know that our future energy system, uh, they are uh, they are facing also a big challenges. Uh, the challenges, as, as we know, that uh, decarbonisation means that the the generation side, uh, we have a lot of distributed renewables are connected uh, at all uh, voltage level. Uh, but also, um, in, and, and, and then the renewable generations pretty much focus on the uh, the, the coastal, uh, you know, um, uh, area as well. So, so, uh, so the the, the power system uh, obviously uh, make a lot of uh, power supply, power generation is is is, is undergoing a, a major shift. Likewise, uh, the um, the decarbonization of the um, the user side, uh, basically, you know, transport, uh, the uh, you know, homes, hard buildings, uh, as well as um, uh, industry, they all uh, expect uh, uh, decarbonization uh, means uh, a significant uh, demand increase in the uh, next twenty to thirty years as well. Um, uh, and hence, um, the the power network uh, is uh, under a lot of pressures. So the future system is running largely on renewables. Uh, gonna have, you know, gonna have a, a major impact uh, on the transport system. So if, if we look at the um, the two networks, uh, one is the uh, the GB uh, transmission networks, uh, uh, and those uh, transmission networks, you can see here uh, these uh, transmission lines across different regions where, uh, you know, around these uh, energy intensive uh, sites, but also around where the uh, renewables uh, were available as well. So, so if you look at the transport railways, because uh, the reason that rail, railways, um, the railway systems and the underground as well, uh, and so the transport railways, if you look at the railway networks, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, London is one of the uh, hotspots and then, uh, and then go through uh, the uh, Milan, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, this area. So there are a few hotspots, um, and, but if you look at the hotspots of the two, uh, they obviously are not uh, the same. So that means uh, when the the railway system, uh, the uh, the railway systems, uh, which meet uh, both networks are pretty much 
sprawling across the two, uh, you know, the, the, the whole country, but they are not necessarily overlapping. So the means that the railways may travel somewhere at the, the weak point of the power network, or some areas, which, for example, well, for example, like Scotland, the West of Scotland, you probably have less capacity uh, or, or no, uh, no uh, connection. So, uh, so that is the, uh, the dilemma here, uh, means that these two networks, they are coupled, uh, but they are not necessarily uh, 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 supporting each other always. Um, so that presents a major challenge uh, to the railway electrification. Um, so the railway network, uh, the network, uh, railway network uh, is currently uh, is the single largest electricity consumer. So every year it consumes more than four terawatt hour electricity, which is comes to uh, 1.2, right? Um, before COVID, uh, you know, um, UK uh, GB's uh, electricity consumption is around 300, uh, 30 issues uh, terawatt hour. Uh, and during COVID, this has probably dropped uh, slightly uh, to around the region of 300 terawatt hour uh, per annum. And uh, so you can see here uh, the electricity uh, consumptions from the uh, from the railways, uh, pretty much uh, over one more than one percent of the total uh, consumptions. Now, keep in mind, uh, um, as I said, uh, we have over uh, one uh, fifteen thousand uh, kilometers or uh, ten mile, ten thousand miles uh, uh, railway roads. Um, we only have forty percent, forty percent electrified. Uh, so, um, so forty percent electrified. So sixty percent of the routes haven't yet been electrified. So that means along the electrification journeys, um, uh, this number obviously will be uh, will be doubled or even more. Um, uh, and uh, if you look at the total electricity energy consumptions, uh, among the four terawatt hours, um, ninety percent, so three point six terawatt hours used for uh, traction, uh, traction, power, uh, real, uh, traction system, so to power the train. Uh, uh, and also uh, another uh, challenge here is that uh, um, uh, over. 2,000 kilometers are not suitable for electrification, either because of uh, no suitable connections to the utility grid, uh, as mentioned, or, uh, or the sites so are not suitable, like uh, you know, through the VDOC or some areas are not suitable to, uh, to put up the panographs. So this is 60% electrify, uh, unelectrified, usually they are, well, the majority use the diesels that generate um, a, a large uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Now the government uh, has committed to uh, phase out all the diesel trains uh, by 2040. Uh, now in Scotland, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, agenda has uh, brought forward to 20. Uh, 2035. So, so those are the uh, scenario of of the challenges here. You know, um, the power networks is undergoing a, a major shift and a significant significant uh, transition moment and uh, expand. You know, uh, build renewables, build energy storage. You know, uh, and strengthen the existing transmission and distribution network. That's, you know, the, all the power flow has changed. On the other hand, um, the railway systems uh, are also uh, need to be, what, 60%. So uh, a lot of railway routes need to be electrified or decarbonized. Uh, so, so the, but keeping in mind that, uh, you know, the, these two uh, infrastructure systems were also uh, quite uh, uh, in, intensive 
and, and they're very expensive as well. Uh, probably some of you recall the um, the the some of the quotes about the total investment uh, electric uh, energy system decarbonization in this country we talk about uh, uh, three to four uh, five trillion uh, pounds sterling uh, to decarbonize the energy system so so uh, but then the other you know the road railways can be cost uh, billions of billions of investment as well so these are all expensive infrastructures to need to be decarbonized. So summarize the failures, as I said, uh, the failures from the uh, the power grid will be cascaded down to uh, transport network, uh, and, and 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 obviously this is vice versa as well. Giving, as I said, uh, the uh, you know the um, railways is the uh, single largest consumer. It consumes uh, one point. 2% of the overall uh, electricity. So it's a, it's, a, it's a single largest one. So any faults will also pass back to the power grid. Likewise, the power grid, as, as shown in the first, on the first slides about the events uh, occurred in 2018, uh, and it shows, uh, you know, these two couplings, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues. Uh, and the second is said uh, these two networks are, are expensive to decarbonize uh, and, and obviously also the infrastructure change i mean if you build transport like uh, railways and also i've been the last few years work on the road as well the road for example electrified road system uh, needs electricity so so those the both are in impact as well so it means you know you talk about the the real uh, the energy systems power networks right they need to also identify file which prioritize which area they need to uh, reinforce the transmission you know the system as well likewise if you electrify the uh, the transport uh, networks you need to find whether this is a capacity there to support uh, the decarbonization so so those are the challenges um so now let's come to um, a uh, the the focus of today's presentation is about the energy hub, uh, which I came up uh, some years ago. And uh, so so basically, um, the energy hub is a mega grid. Uh, is a mega grid. At the moment we think about a uh, uh, DC mega grid uh, and. Uh, and potentially uh, also uh, DC and AC microgrids. Um, but it's different. Uh, the difference in that is not uh, this microgrid, obviously, will integrate renewables uh, and energy storage. Uh, uh, and uh, it will interface with the two systems. Why is the utility grid uh, low, you know, uh, low, high voltage? Uh, to and that will also supply the non-traction uh, uh, re requirements. For example, you know, like Leeds, Manchester. You know, Manchester have three or a few. I think <laughs> Manchester quite a lot of time, like Victoria. You know, uh, Piccadilly. You know, I mean, the, a lot of restaurants, a lot of you know, a uh, lot of buildings around, or you know, this could potentially. Uh, uh, support the long traction. Uh, obviously, the station within the station part, you know, they are taking office as well. So, so we are talking about uh, uh, using the hub uh, to decarbonize, uh, to supply the non tractions, but also it will interface with the traction power supply systems, right? So we talk about non tractions yeah, as a four, four, four fifteen uh, volts, uh, but this trashing system is a single phase twenty five kV system, right? So, so basically, this uh, micro grid will interface with the utility grid as well as the uh, trashing power supply system, and uh, to supply tra non trashing loads. These are non traction nodes as well as the traction nodes. Okay, so that is that is the uh, the design scenarios. And then now we build a hub 
uh, energy of hub around the stations. Now, why do we, we, we talk about around the stations? Because uh, uh, the stations, there are spaces where, you know, car parks, you know, uh, roofs potentially uh, could, could recruit, you know, for the re renewables. A lot of rural areas, you know, there are vast lands you might also use like uh, solar array and others as well, or local to renewables that, uh, you know, can access. Uh, and uh, then that will be used to, uh, and also the attractions, you know, a lot of trains, right, moving in like Manchester, Piccadilly and move out. Actually, um, I say that the electricity, uh, railway, uh, train, trains use 90%, um, which is uh, 3.6, uh, terror hours used for tractions. Theoretically, uh, one third of the the energy can be recovered. That because just like we drive the car, right? Uh, you uh, cruising and costing and then braking, particularly braking, uh, that power can be recycled. So theoretically, they would say that the one third could be recycled. So basically, around the stations, which you know, the trains move across to the station, and then this regenerative power could be rather than sent back to the feeder station, which is a feeder station usually, uh, you know, sometimes thirty, you know, thirty kilometers away, or you know, even longer away. So if you transmit back, send back, uh, they will get lost as well as you push the, the voltage up. So then you we can we can recycle those and put them in any uh, storage here as well. So so that is the purpose. And then obviously near the station, you know, we have car parks, you know, uh, and others, you, you know, can coordinate everybody, you know, we are interested in the V2G, uh, V2X basically, isn't it? Uh, that's a lot of work being now I have been working on V2X uh, back to 2010, 2000. But this is love. The country are running all these V2X uh, projects everywhere. So, so those are the concepts um, uh, about uh, the railway. Uh, and the the engine hubs are built uh, around the railway stations. In UK, there are over 2,500. Uh, railway stations, uh, but a majority, uh, we have around uh, 200, 300 large one, but the majority spread across a lot of countryside. Uh, so that is the, the station. So, uh, and then the feeder stations, which is, uh, I say that, um, you know, the, the trains are supplied by the traction system. Uh, and uh, trains are supplied by traction system and hence there's a uh, every uh you know so the between the two feeder stations so roughly about the 60 kilometers so so you know one feeder station one arm has one face another arm another in like an a phase and a, and a c phase so each face each arms covers uh probably 30 kilometers roughly so um so uh, so there are also feeder stations. So the idea is that you could we could coordinate the feeder station, railway feeder station, which is in this country over a couple hundred, more than a couple hundred feeder stations, as well as the energy hub, we, we called small microgrids, around 2,500 uh, stations. And now then they can form a, now this, those colleagues work uh, working on the VP, VPP, right, which are power plants or, or you know, you, you can coordinate them and therefore to support the railway energy uh, network. So, uh, and then make it more strong and resilient. And also if these are, are coordinated, they can provide the service to utility grid as well. So that is the, the concepts. Uh, the concept of energy hub, and then uh, the, the second concept are called a uh, networked uh, energy hubs. And then this hubs, uh, well, then uh, obviously, uh, well, then uh, decarbonize the railway system, support the decarbonization of railway system, but also can support 
the ancillary service to utility grid. Keep in mind that the railways is already the single largest uh, electricity user, right? Okay, I hope that that makes uh, clear uh, about the the context. Uh, uh, and so we we this technology obviously, uh, you know, they are the first in the world uh, uh, because in the interface with both the utility grid and also the traction power supply system as well. So, um, so this is the first of in the world. Uh, there are some underpinning uh, technology as well uh, that in terms of uh, the machine learning, uh, digital trends, because, uh, you know, basically if we want to coordinate the power flows, uh, and uh, you, the house and uh, the stations according that you need, uh, you know, um, need uh, a, a, a suitable tools to understand the power flows and manage the power flows. And then obviously the wide area planning and operation. So that's broadly about the overall system coordination and, and you know, my bag ones controls about the modeling predictions and control operate oper optimization so on and and obviously uh, and because it interface uh, with the uh, with different uh, uh, facilities at different voltage level at uh, uh, both AC and DC and with traction non traction uh, uh, and three phase single phase so we need a novel power electronics uh, devices and uh, topology as well. And that coordinate and need advanced control framework. So those are the technology underpinning uh, the energy hub. Um, so the energy hub, we came up, uh, I came up with this idea back to four or five years ago. Uh, and then we, uh, trying to obviously this is a major uh, initiative um so we uh advocate this concept to the industry so we uh we have a phased approach so discovery phase uh RFF, discovery phase is to look at the feasibility cost you know cab those things uh you know understand you know complexity uh, and so on uh, and then uh, alpha phase, uh, we look at the design, actual design, um, uh, minimal viable uh, designs, uh, and look at the business models because the energy hub itself it's pretty much interface, uh, you know, with both the traction, you know, railway network, as well as um, uh, a utility grid. And and also um, obviously the asset could be owned by railway, could be the third party. So this is a round of uh, business model as well, uh, and also uh, regulation and the policy barriers. And the reason is, um, you know, uh, the major industry like railways, pretty much a lot of uh, uh, major uh, industry they have a special contract with the uh, system operator. Uh, and therefore, whether you know a lot of designs we propose, whether they are accepted by the system operator, accepted by the market, accepted by different stakeholder, this is something uh, we need to explore as well. So <laughs> this is a more slightly uh, rather than engineering, this more uh, interdisciplinary uh, approach. And then the beta phase, uh, we uh, will then select a, 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 a particular routes and, and the stations to demonstrate and the standardization uh, as well. And then, uh, and then we'll then uh, the final phase will then uh, roll out uh, as business uh, as usual. So, so this is a three phase. Uh, five phase, uh, four phase, sorry, uh, four phase. Oh, it's, it's, it's in the mid days. <laughs> uh, sometimes, uh, uh, apologies for, for, for I, 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 I say some wrong words. Uh, okay. Uh, so the discovery phase, uh, supported by system operator, uh, we, and, and the railway, uh, industries, we, uh, assessed it, uh, different stations uh, in, in Scotland and, and England uh, cover busy, like busy station, like, uh, you know, um, uh, Edinburgh, uh, uh, you know, 
Edinburgh there are a few stations so we've laid um, you know urban rural stations uh, you know those countryside I say that there are over 2,000 to 500 uh, stations across the country so we look at those uh, different sites we've done, conduct the cost benefit analysis of the four um, uh, energy hub uh, design scenarios uh, and we have done the software and how in the validation so basically we look at the uh, the scenario one, which is a very traditional, uh, traditional scenario, which is you basically this sometimes you could see, you know, in this country, there are a few projects on railways, you know, uh, railway stations, uh, those, um, uh, uh, so, you know, roof PVs plus battery storage to uh, decarbonize the land traction load for the station. So this is a this is one existing in uh, in this uh, in UK and uh, and I mean other countries as well. And the second scenario is we look at the cover broadly car parks uh, to and the EV charging as well. And the third scenario is then. Uh, those first scenario one, scenario two, to look at the um, look at the um, uh, non traction load. Um, the scenario three now we look at the interface with the uh, the traction uh, power supply system. So we then look at the regenerative power from trains and provide ancillary service to the utility grid. So so those. Three scenario three is our solution for uh, for uh, for most of the railways uh, stations uh, hub solution for most of the railway stations. Scenario one and scenario two is more or less for uh, uh, smaller uh, stations, uh, rural stations. Um, so scenario four is about uh, as mentioned over. 10, uh, 10 uh, 2000 kilometers of, of the routes are not electrified. So basically they're gonna run battery trains or hydrogen trains. Um, but given the prices and also technology maturity, uh, battery trains are likely gonna be the first being used in, in the GB uh, system. So, uh, so the scenario four, we look at the lo local, local renewables and uh, and to charge the battery trains. So those are very focused the design, uh, suitable for, as they say, the, uh, some hundreds of stations that um, are not electrified. So they're gonna run uh, railway uh, battery trains. Okay, so that is the work we've done, we finished and uh, we, we have identified a number of benefits uh, in terms of the, you know, uh, as mentioned earlier, but also, uh, you know, capital investment saves billions of capital costs. As I say, the electrification itself is, is very expensive. And then hence, this hub technology will be, uh, be saved a lot of, it means because in, it's also natural as well, because a lot of uh, rural areas, you don't have four or five or six trains per day. You don't need to, you know, but then electrification, you talk about one million per, uh, per truck kilometer. So that's very expensive if you, if you electrify, if we electrify the whole tracks for rural stations, you don't, we don't have, you know, frequent services. Uh, so that will save billions of capital costs, and then uh, also for uh, railway systems uh, and service service, <coughs> you know, well, because of decarbonization, uh, use of renewables will save the OPEX by mil uh, by millions, uh, and also uh, and service service if it is allowed, also the billions uh, of services. And, and payback time also, uh, at the moment we estimated uh, around, you know, it depends on different designs really, um, between 10 years plus and minus. Okay, so the alpha phase uh, we are doing now is to design, so engineering design, uh, the hubs. Uh, we have worked with the railway industry and the system operator to identify a route, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, in uh, in this country, uh, 
to look at this is the uh, west uh, uh, scotland uh, and this road uh, this station uh, uh, so so uh, we look at the live demonstrations uh, moment uh, I, uh, that's the ongoing project so i will uh, i will um, i will uh, just briefly give you the idea about what they're doing so now, finally, uh, let me talk about the technologies. I mentioned the four technology pillows, right? So power electronics and, uh, uh, and digital training AIs uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also um, control, obviously. Uh, so, so I will quickly go through some of the technologies uh, we've been working. The first one is uh, MMC, uh, which is uh, the um, uh, modular, uh, multi-level uh, converter-based uh, uh, renewable integrated feed stations. So, uh, because you can see the energy hubs, it's uh, integrated with renewables, and also it is a uh, power electronics-based um, system. And the second, particularly, I like to raise one of the new uh, topology we used. Uh, proposed it is called the power buffer uh, device, which um, we proposed uh, for DC microgrid. I say that uh, the DC microgrid will be used uh, for uh, for most of our hubs. The power buffer uh, allows this called mobile plug-in dynamic forming of the microgrid. So you allow the plug and the play of the uh, of the uh, any support device like uh, storage or you know you connect multiple uh, micro grid so on so forth so this is a new device uh, we have proposed from uh, this group and then i talk a little bit about uh, quickly go through some of the ai machine learning applications Oh, so uh, sorry, uh, yeah. excuse me, excuse me, Professor Ring. I just uh, would like to um, mention that uh, it's um, it's fifteen minutes to to three. So uh, if you might um, complete in five minutes, it would be great. So we have some time for the the questions. Sure, yeah, uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank sure, you. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so as a technology, obviously, uh, I will just quickly go through this. Um, this is a traditional uh, traction power supply system. So basically, you connect it to the uh, 133 uh, kVs or 33 kVs um, or higher, and then is a transformer and three-phase uh, transformer convert to single-phase 25 kV. So this is a single uh, power supply system. Uh, this is a typical uh, uh, current state of art uh, for the traction power supply. So it's 25 kV uh, three phase. Now the dual end means that if you, but the issue with this is that there's a lot of problem with this because you've got a feeder station, you've got a, um, each arm covers 30 kilometers roughly, right? Um, and then and the in between there should be a neutral station. So there's no power supply. And then that end, the next end will be supplied by like a phase, you know, if this phase is phase A, the next phase will be phase C, but in between there's no uh, no connection, so it will be neutral. That causes a lot of sparks. You see a lot of trains across, you'll see the sparks, and that was because of the neutral zones. And of course, a lot of faults as well. So the dual end power supplies with the, uh, well, power, uh, converter based uh, stations then this is uh, the neutral session will be cancelled out and then the trains move around you can actually uh, uh, control the to the feeder stations to jointly supply the power to the uh, to the trains moving uh, within the segment and so this is a uh, this is the idea I proposed um, and so these scenarios are basically the feeder stations are uh, are pretty much uh, again uh, you know uh, connect to the utility grid, and then do all the power electronics devices to provide you know convert to single phase to provide uh, power supply to the utility grid. So we uh, come up with the uh, uh, you know. Uh, to control, if you got two feeder stations, right, to jointly supply trains moving 
uh, between the two feeder stations, we have to model as you know we do the power network. So you need to model the power networks. Likewise for the power tractions, we need to model the. So this is the power traction network model uh, we have built. And then for trains moving around the feeder stations, so we have to model the train, uh, and uh, and then we model the. Um, uh, and then we, once we model train and the traction network, supply network, then we'll be able to apply the uh, droop control, which is uh, like our, most of our power systems, we use droop control. Uh, I like a droop control though, those people we are working, myself is a, uh, is a power engineer, you know, electrical, uh, you know, uh, control engineer, we would like the more advanced control method, but actually droop control or P control is, is 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 favored in most of cases i'll talk later uh, so we you apply droop control uh, uh, and uh, and then power sharing uh use the power sharing to supply and that gives a reduce the power losses uh, of the uh, of the of the system uh, so that is the uh, the first work we use this uh, uh more advanced um uh uh, converter-based uh, feeder stations rather than using traditional stations. Uh, so, and the second uh, is the uh, the renewable integrations. Uh, now, if we got the renewable integrations, uh, there are, there are different way of where the renewable integrate uh, will be integrated. Either you directly integrate with the uh, with the high voltage uh, network, where it could in in work connect to the traction, uh, connect to the uh, twenty five kV overhead lines, where uh, work with the interface in a grid compensator, uh, or the conditioner, uh, or you know different conditioners, where can work with the actual work with the uh, as mentioned earlier, the uh, converter-based uh, stations. So that's different mm -hmm. way that uh, the renewables can be integrated. Uh, and so in our study, we look at the uh, the um, renewables are integrated with the uh, the uh, uh, static frequency converter-based feeder station. So so basically, uh, the renewables. Are integrated with the DC link of this um, of this uh, static frequency converter. So that we sh we introduce the a new control methods uh, basically because you if you look at the the systems here because the load is a variable and also the renewables are also a variable. Then the DC link the voltage you have to control it. How do you control it? Uh, then we use this three-phase MMC connect utility grid control the DC voltage. So that's the idea we, we've done. And we also come up with this uh, DC voltage uh, stabilization control and the grid AC voltage control so that to stabilize uh, the DC voltage link. Uh, so that we have shown very good results. And uh, even we look at the extreme conditions, if both the renewable generation and the traction load change, we still could maintain a, a very good uh, uh, um, DC voltage uh, uh, performance, regulation performance. Uh, the next technology is the power buffer. Uh, so this power buffer is a recent new device proposed by this group. Uh, this key thing is that uh, support this dynamic forming of the DC microgrid. So that's the first thing. And it allows the plug and the play of the uh, grid support unit. Um, and also we will be able to uh, maintain uh, the DC uh, voltage as well. So, so what we do here is that we introduce um, this so-called um, the uh, this so-called power buffer. So power buffer, so this is a, a grid support unit, could be like uh, battery storage systems, could be other micro grid, and this is supposed to be the renewable generations. So so between these two, we 
created this power buffer device. Basically, is a large capacitor plus this uh, back and boost converter, and that then we could allow the G grid support unit like battery storage. You can plug in and plug out easily, and without causing dis uh, interruptions to DC bus voltage, uh, and uh, and also you could. Uh, co control the buffers use advanced methods like model predictive control uh, in, uh, so on and therefore you can also maintain other uh, performance like uh, you know minimal minimize the voltage deviations uh, and also uh, increase the inertia because we know that inertia is very important and the other uh, control uh, purpose so we've done that in hardware in loop to test the buffer power buffer and also down the uh, the real circuit uh, tests of the system. So now we are looking at the practical application of this power buffer technology for the DC magnetic grid. And finally, my apology, I just used to be a longer time. Uh, and so we, the machine learnings can be used basically in all the modeling control and the optimization. Uh, we use here one of the method uh, area we, area we look at is uh, look at the um, the uh, energy management of the uh, power compensators with rene renewable integrations. So we can uh, manage the operation of this uh, uh, co phase systems so that we could manage the thermal uh, conditions of power electronics and energy storage we also can provide the utility grid as well. So those are machine learnings could be used. Uh, given the time constraints, I will not uh, elaborate. Uh, this is just, we use this uh, DQN technologies for this. But again, this is quite something new, hasn't been done before. Look at both power electronics and battery storage, uh, thermal management. We also use the machine learnings uh, for the uh, for the uh, train tra uh, trajectories, the trains moving from one station, another station, and also you got the passenger load uncertainty as well. How do you optimize the trajectories? Can you know minimize the energy consumption while you also meet the constraints? For example, move from A to B leads to Manchester within say one hour or 15 minutes. So, so those again, machine learning could be used. Okay, so this will come to my conclusions where I just show you the coupling of the power grid and transport networks will demand the coordinate plan, the monitoring, modeling, control, and operation. So this is a whole system approach is required. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the power electronics devices, you know, the novel and the controls as machine learning tools are very important to unlock the the flexibility potential of the whole systems. Okay, that's me. Thank you. I I, I apologize that I will run. So and uh, hopefully, uh, that's Thank me. You. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting uh, talk. I think that uh, uh, we have uh, just a few minutes for uh, for some questions. I see that uh, uh, there are uh, already questions uh, in the in the chat, um, and. Uh, there is a uh, fun link that uh, thank you um, for the, the very interesting talk. And um, they have two questions. When consider electrification of rail, how to take into account other transport modes networks without making the system model uh, too complicated? Uh, mm. Yeah, and maybe I can uh, I can uh, read the second questions later. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, I, I think, yeah, finally, you're absolutely right. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, and good to see you again. Um, yes, um, yes, indeed. Um, the system will be, uh, you consider other modes, uh, it's likely will increase complexity. The complexity actually is not only technology complexity. Now, the address the complexity, uh, we have proposed, uh, you know, the different technology, the energy hub, uh, power, uh, power, um, the power hub of the technology is uh, allows the plug in play. So the future systems technology, we can use the modular approaches to 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 scale down, scale up and scale down. That would 
uh, you know, make uh, the system less complicated and also can scale up quickly. Uh, you know, transmo transportation mode really, you know, like um, the you know, the road system so on, um, is is important. Um, but then, uh, you know, uh, there, there are different ways that this coupling, right? As I say, that it's important to consider coupling because they both are uh, uh, both infrastructure, transport, and uh, and and power systems. They are all expensive to invest and to build. And therefore, one thing change that you, you impact on others. So you need to consider collectively. But how do you make the model or, or too complicated? I think, you know, that you look at the different levels, right? Uh, holistically, you need to consider, uh, obviously you need a different model to, to simplify. For example, the coupling aspects, you might uh, use more uh, simpler models rather than more complicated like transient you might use uh, steady state uh, to analyze the couplings or even use graph based method to analyze the coupling of different modes so there are different tools to simplify uh, the the models uh, and 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 technology wise as i say that you could use a modular approach to to look at it um okay Thank you very much. And the other, um, the, the last question, I think, given the time, uh, is what are the challenges of the coordination of both networks from the operation perspective and regulatory decision making perspective? And if you also can comment on the role of data in this, it would be great. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think in terms of barriers, um, the examples here, um, for example, we there are a lot of barriers. I think we probably look at the uh, the policy barrier first, right? The technology is a lot of things that are mature enough. You know, I mentioned this module approach is pretty much we talk to industry are standard. You know, they are using the module approach. But I think it's more uh, about the, obviously there are a few barriers. One is the policy barrier. For example, utility grid, uh, power grid, uh, sorry, railway systems. They they probably are not allow you to export. Uh, uh, even you have the access of powers, you export the bill, not get it, you know, the, because of special contracts with system operators, you might not get benefit for benefit from 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 exporting. Uh, so so this is a, around the policy aspect. Uh, but our policy aspect is not only be, be, be between the different barriers, not only between different sectors, but within the 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 same sector for example power networks we when we design the uh, the energy hub you know we talk about the the battery size renewable generations you know in the megawatts but then if this megawatts capacity regeneration or storage installed at the distribution level uh, you know the connection cannot um, the connection will not uh, are confined by the uh, by the uh, by the system uh, grid, so we call the uh, grid code. Uh, so, for example, connections like a G hundred, you know, for how much the uh, the the power you ex expect to export. So, they are also within the sector. There are barriers as well, policy barrier, code barrier uh, as well. Uh, and the financial, obviously, uh, investment is uh, is a, a big thing. Uh, now we are feeling this, uh, you know, hardcore uh, issues. One of the hardcore issues is the investment. Um, the investment, uh, there's a lot of good technology, some technology issue, but then the financially, you know, who gonna invest? What are the business model? Again, uh, that's the the barrier as well for for this. Uh, in terms of the big data, obviously. Uh, it can be used uh, uh, pretty much cross uh, from business models, uh, from the uh, system operating. For example, if they have, you know, join the the market, uh, if you know, uh, again, you know, the, the power tra transactions, those are all need to be taken into account, and then this need the data as well. But the later on, you know, we do build the digital trains, do the control, as I mentioned, a few examples. But control, design, optimization, all the data are needed. Uh, however, however, the issue here is obviously 
as we do modeling and control, uh, we big data is always, we have two problems. One is the curse of dimensionality issues. So you got enormous data, how do you handle it? And the second is I, I, I can, again, because of the dimensionality, you don't have sufficient data as well. Uh, if your problem dimension is too, too large. So those are still, uh, are the, the big data or data machine learning need to be addressed uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very, um, it is very, um, really, really interesting topic. And I think I have many other questions myself, but uh, uh, we, we ran out of time and uh, we have to, to close the meeting. So I would like to thank you, virtually applaud you <laughs> the, for the very interesting talk and also the interesting uh, question. Thank you very much uh, once again to be uh, with us and um, uh, see you <laughs> next time. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Your, for your patience. Thank you.